Uh, and get your Bibles out. Let's get your Bibles out. Colossians chapter 3. We've turned a corner in our Renaissance series. And uh, chapter 2, uh, we finished that up last week. The apostle has, is, is done at this moment with his declarations against the false teachers. He has been super purposeful, very pointed about making sure that the church, which includes us, understands who Jesus is. That's critical. That's like the main thing, friends. We've got to understand who Jesus is and what this good news is that God has given to the human race through Christ. The gospel is critical, friends. And so that's what he's been doing in all of these, these first two chapters and all of these messages is making sure that the church understands the gospel, that it is not about what we do for God. It is about what God has done for us, right? It's about our position in Christ Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God, very God, came in the flesh, dwelt among us. He gave His life, conquered death, erased sin, gives life, removes condemnation, and gifts people with eternal life. That's what this is all about, friends. It's about what God has done for us, not what we do for God. Now, do we respond to the grace of God? Most certainly, but it's a response. It's not the initiation. God's the initiator, always the initiator, right? Right? So as we've turned this corner, now he's beginning to instruct the church on how to live this out in their everyday lives, right? So this is where we're at. Now, our text, our text deals with a big, kind of a big topic today. It addresses a big topic, topic and that is focus. So, so my, I picture this, I, and I, you just have to, I don't know why I picture this. It's, it's, it, it would be difficult for you to be me. It's difficult for me to be me. Why do I see things the way I see things? I don't know. It's a, it's a mystery, actually. But I, I picture, have you ever seen a director, like uh, somebody who's directing a, a cast of, to do a play or something, and, and they're, they're trying to do rehearsal, and the cast is being distracted by lots of different things, and they're not paying close attention to the rehearsal. And so the director, this is what I picture. It's a two-finger clap, and he's going like this. Focus, people. Focus. Huh? And I picture that's what the Apostle Paul is doing for the church. He's saying to us, the Word of God is saying to us, all right, focus, people. Right? There, there are lots of things, lots of things in this life that we could concentrate on. There are lots of things in this life that can distract us. God wants us to focus. Right? So, our popular psychology says, Where's the focus? It's inward. Popular psychology says, look in. Look inward. It even at times will tell us, look outward. But the Word of God tells us to look upward, right? So look at our text, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through verse 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So those addressed are those who have, as we've already addressed from Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, they have received Christ Jesus the Lord. They have been forgiven. They have been gifted with eternal life. They are alive in Christ. They have died to sin. They are alive in Christ. And the apostle says that those who are alive in Christ, first thing we notice is that are, those who are alive in Christ are to be in pursuit of Christ. We're talking about focus. If then you have been raised with Christ, now remember, Several different times throughout this letter, we've looked, we've seen the word if, and we've clarified each time, whether it's a conditional clause or a, or, or a, uh, 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 a it, it basically just establishes something as normal, right? It's conditional versus cause. So what I'm trying to say, get it out. This is not conditional. He's not wondering whether or not they're alive in Christ, if they've died to sin and are alive in Christ. He's saying, since it's true. Since it's true that you have died to sin, since it's true that you've been raised with Christ, so those who are alive in Christ 
are to be in pursuit of Christ. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I'm going to give, can I call a time out for just a moment? Time out. We're having microphone issues this morning. Throughout the first service, first gathering, it happened over and over and over. All of a sudden, there'll be a big pop. We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, we will figure it out, but maybe not during this gathering. So every once in a while, if there's a big pop, I'll jump, you'll jump, and then we'll move on. <laughs> okay? It's fair. Is that fair warning? Okay, time in. Here we are. So we, we've, we've long established this, that, that Christ died for us, but that also we have to understand that we died with Him. That's, that's back up to verse 20 of chapter 2. If with Christ you died, now he says, if with Christ you've been raised. So we die with Christ, but we're raised with Christ as well. We are alive in Christ, gifted with eternal, abundant life. So he says, we are to seek. What are we to seek? The things that are above where Christ is. So we pursue Christ because we're alive in Christ. But this idea, notice it says, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It's a little bit misleading here. We're, we're actually supposed to seek someone, not something. When we read it in our English text, this idea of seeking, it says the things that are above. In, in the Greek, which was the original language this letter was written in, it doesn't say seek the things that are above. It simply reads, seek the above. It's a, it's a little different, isn't it? Seek not the things that are above. Now, if you've read the Bible before, you know that God gives us glimpses of what is above. We have pictures, these glimpses. Jesus said, my, in my Father's house are many rooms. Or in the old translations, it says, my Father's, there are many mansions, right? So we get this picture of what's above. We're, we get a picture in the, in, the book of, in the book of Revelation that there's streets that are made of gold and such, probably just figurative language in that way, trying to describe certain things that are unimaginable for us, that's beyond comprehension for us to truly grasp the things that are above. But this doesn't actually tell us to seek the things that are above. It says to seek the above. It, and, and we're told what's above. There's no reference to things at all. It's Christ who is above. And it's God the Father who is above. So we get this picture, right? Right? God Almighty, the living God, is seated on His throne, and He's reigning, and He's ruling sovereignly in His justice and in His steadfast love. He is above, and Christ, His eternal Son, the one who has made redemption possible for each and every human being, he became the mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus, is seated, finished work. We looked at that two weeks ago or last week or whatever it was. He is seated because the work has been done. It is a complete work. He is, it was last week, he is our Sabbath, remember? He's our rest. We do not labor any longer. We rest in Christ and he's seated at the right hand of God. This is the picture we get. So it isn't something that we seek. It's someone that we seek. You get it? Right? It's the someone, not the something. So, so think about it like this. When Jesus was asked what the greatest of all of the commandments are, now just about anybody knows uh, some things about the Bible, that there's the Ten Commandments and that there's these various other... There's, there's lots of commandments in the Bible. God, doesn't, God is not shy about sharing what He expects of us. He's very clear about it, actually, and we're grateful for it. And what's great also is that he's super consistent about it. He's very consistent about what he expects of his people. He's, he's just, he's, he's fair about all of that. And, and he's legit, those are legitimate expectations, right? But when asked what the greatest of all the commandments is, Jesus didn't refer to a rule. That's interesting, isn't it? He referred to a relationship, Somebody came to him, actually trying to trick him. They were, du they were being a little bit duplicitous and, and said, what's the greatest, in all, uh, greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is not a rule. It's a relationship. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the greatest commandment. This is, this is the heart of what we're talking about here. 
So when Paul says now, turning the corner, I'm done correcting the false teachers, I've established foundationally who, as Christians, as Christ followers, we are in Christ. Now he says, now I'm going to begin to instruct you on how to live this out in your daily lives. The first thing he says is seek the above. In your daily lives, in all that you're doing, seek someone, not something. Seek the above. Look to, look to God. Pursue Christ, he says, in all of your life. This is what he's saying. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So, so in reality, if you think of your pursuit of Christ as a duty or an obligation or some sort of responsibility on your part, you're not yet seeing this text as God wants you to see it. It's not about duty or responsibility or obligation. It's about relationship. It's about desire. It, it's, the, it's the heart of the matter. So, so uh, let me illustrate it like this. Um, I cannot stand peas. I hate peas. They're so gross. I just, even saying the word makes my little gag reflex flutter a little bit. <laughs> now, if you're, if you're young here, you're still, you know, responsible to mom and dad as a child, and they're telling you to eat peas, you go right ahead. But for the rest of you, I'm just here to tell you in all joy, freedom, and confidence that at some point, you don't have to eat what your mom tried to get you to eat when you were a kid. My mom told me that if she ever found the peas in the dishwater again, that she was going to make me eat them out of the sink. So I found other creative ways to get rid of my peas rather than just dumping them into the dishwater at, at the end of the meal. I just, they just, I just can't like them, friends. I cannot like them. Now, if you ask me whether, I, whether or not I like ribs that are in my crock pot at this moment, and there's going to be some coleslaw, right? Now, the Hawks game's coming on in just a little bit, and we got some friends coming over. There's going to be ribs on the table. Now we're talking. If you tell me, hey, Brent, there's a big bowl of peas at the table, I'm going to find some, like, I'm going to instantly be very spiritual, and I'm going to be like, you know, I just feel like I need to be fasting for a while. I feel like I just got to pray and concentrate on God, you know? But if you say, hey, the ribs are on the table, you, you don't have to talk me into that. There's no sense of, uh, man, I, re- I guess I better go eat those. There's a big difference here, isn't there? When he says, since then you have been raised with Christ, we're alive in Christ, friends. God has forgiven us, liberated us, given us eternal life, and we're, we're not, this isn't about an obligation. This is about, like, we, we get to come to the table, friends. We are to seek the things that are above. We get to seek the one who is above, if you will, right? So we're to, and, and, and this word seek, it, it's a verb, and, and it's in its present imperative form. And so it's the idea that we keep on doing it. It's not a one-time thing. You do it, and then, well, I, I seek, I sought the Lord, I found him. Like hide-and-seek. Remember the game hide-and-seek when we were kids? Some of you still play it. I don't know. Maybe. But somebody hides, and then somebody else tries to find them. And once they find the person that was hiding, the game's over, and you have to like, play a new version, another game, if you want to play again. The game's over once you find the person. That's not what... He's saying, seek the things that are above. It's like you, you seek the things that are above, but... Even though you found the one who is above, you don't stop seeking him. You keep seeking him. It's what A.W. Tozer called the paradox of love. A paradox is something that's true, but it seems contradictory. He He says it like this, To have found God and still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. And and of course, now, if if we're thinking really soundly, How about this word? If our soteriology is straight, soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. If our soteriology is straight, it isn't about us finding God. It's about God finding us. It's always been about God finding us. We don't seek God. He seeks us. We don't find Him. He finds us, right? This goes all the way back to Genesis, right? Perfect setting, beautiful, perfect fellowship. And God warns Adam, The day you eat the fruit, you'll die. The day you eat the fruit, you will be separated from me. So, the unfortunate disaster happens, and he and his wife eat the fruit. 
and they instantly experience separation from God. First thing they do is hide and feel shame. Then what? They start looking for God. God comes looking for them. And he says, Adam, where are you? And God doesn't ask Adam where he is because God doesn't know where Adam is. God asks Adam where he is because Adam doesn't know where he is. He's been ravaged by sin and he doesn't realize just how much destruction he just set in motion. He is now separated from the living God and he's not going to find his way back, friends. God has to come looking for him and he does. And it's the gospel story right in Genesis chapter 3. So God finds us, but we don't stop seeking him. We keep on seeking him. It's, it, it's, it's not that all different than that of a, of a marriage, of a healthy, strong, vibrant marriage. You know, a, a man uh, and, a, and a woman, uh, the man will pursue the woman to, to win her heart in love. And then in winning her heart in love, he asks for her hand in marriage. And she's been one, and so she says yes, and they tie the knot. But if they're wise, they don't stop seeking one another. They don't stop pursuing one another. They continue to pursue one another. Not, not so that they could tie the knot again. The knot's already been tied. Not so they could win the hand again. The hand's already been won. But so that they can keep the flames of love alive and vibrant. And this is why Paul says, You've been, we've been found, friends. Now continue to seek the one who made you alive. Right? It's what the psalmist conveyed when he said, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Right? So we seek this one, not something, but someone. We, we continue to seek him, and we seek him then in the midst of life. Remember, Paul is trying to get them to understand who they are in Christ and how to live for Jesus in everyday life. So we seek Christ, not aloof from the things of this world. If, if we're getting our education, we should be engaged in that. They're, they're not diametrically opposed. Seek Christ or seek an education. That's not no, you seek Christ while you're getting your education. If you're, pursuing, if you're pursuing your work, your career, you don't do that apart from Christ. You do that with Christ. You, seek, you pursue Christ in the midst of, of, of engaging in those things. Even leisure is done with Christ. Right? We pursue Him as we are involved in the things of this life. It's in connection with Him, not apart from Him. And then, then we can understand then that we don't engage in anything that Jesus wouldn't join us with. There's lots of things in this life that Jesus doesn't join people in. A lot of different activities, if you will. But not from His people. We, we say, no way, we're not going to engage in those things. I maybe used to do those things, but I'm not who I used to be. So there's no, no way I'm going to engage in those things. I'm alive in Christ. You follow? So it's as we pursue these things. And, and, and friends, here's the thing. Are we, are, are we so naive to think that there are those who are alive in Christ who aren't pursuing Christ? At least passionately? Sure there are. There are people who are alive in Christ who are dull right now to the things of God. And God wants to light the flame again. God wants us to pursue Christ because in that there is life. He is to be our focus, friends. Focus, people. Focus. This is the Word of God, right? So if your pursuit isn't Christ, what is it? Think, think for just a moment. Now, now, what if there was somebody to come in and audit our lives? Not to broadcast it to the rest of the world, but just to help us to see. They audit our lives. They take a look at the things that we give ourselves to, the things that we think mostly about, the way we spend our time, the way we invest our resources, our money, they audit the details of our lives. Would they conclude that we're pursuing Christ in the midst of life? 
or that we're pursuing life and we're kind of, we're, we're kind of affiliated with Jesus, right? See, if Christ isn't your pursuit, then what is? And, and what will you do when you get it? What then? What will you do when you don't get it? What will you do when you lose it? See, here's the kind of that sobering reality about focus in life, what we give our hearts to, what we give our attention to, what is it that we will live for? But Christ, even if we get what we're hoping for, we lose. But if our pursuit is Christ, even if we don't get what we're hoping for, we win because Christ is our prize, friends. Christ is our prize. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And the things of life, the things that you need in life, they will be added to you. Pursue Christ, right? So since we are alive in Christ, we pursue Christ. And look at verse 2, we concentrate on Christ. We're to seek the above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, not setting our minds on things that are on the earth doesn't mean for you students that you don't have to pay attention in school anymore. You're like, hey, I just discovered Ephesians, or Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, I don't have to think about this stuff. Physical science, pff, that's of the earth, right? Mathematics, pff, of the earth. Thinking about Jesus right now. Well, if you try that tactic, your, your grades and your future will likely reflect it. You've misappropriated the scriptures at that point, right? This isn't, this isn't what the apostle's saying here. He's saying it's, it's not that we, we don't, aren't able to think about the things uh, of our lives, our jobs, our next vacation, whatever. He's saying, he's referring to the godless things. Set your mind, set your mind on the things of God. Set your mind on the things that are above. What are the things that are above? It's again, it's the above. Set your minds on those someone, not the things, whether on earth or in heaven, if you will. I would, I would illustrate it like this. When I was, uh, I, I mentioned a couple of months ago that my grandfather, um, that he used to run a cement finishing company. So they finished concrete. And mostly residential, and, and I had the, I would say a privilege. Uh, I'm not sure, I guess it was a privilege. I got paid at least to work for him for three summers. And, um, and I learned some things uh, about concrete and make it, having a good pour, making sure that, that things were right. And the forms make all the difference, right? You've got to set the forms. And uh, so you've got to get your elevations right so that once the concrete is there and in and the rains come down, the water doesn't fall into the house. It actually falls away from the house. Super important, right? You can problems forever if you don't get that right. But when you're setting those forms, you actually have to stake them down. That's the labor of it. You can't just like set two by fours down on the ground and then when you pour the concrete, it flows out of that chute with a lot of force. And, and if you just set, the form, set those, those two by fours down on the ground, the, the, the concrete will just blow them away, right? And if you don't set the stakes deep into the ground, again, you're going to have these bows and warps and all kinds of problems. So you've got to stake those forms in place and you've got to nail them off. And you've got to do it right or you're going to live with some problems. And I, I think about this when he says, set your minds. There's, there's a level of concentration that is necessary. Set your minds, he says. There, there are some things that people think about that they concentrate on in life that warp them to their own ruin. There's plenty of things that like concrete flowing out of the chute will just blow you away if you're not set. Right? I, I think about, I think about the, the reality of selfish ambition, right? I mean, the scriptures, the scriptures warn us against selfish ambition. As Christians, we are, we're, we're to die to ourselves because we've died with Christ. We're alive to Christ, so we seek those things that are above. But there are people who are, who are selfishly motivated in their, in their lives, and then because they're selfishly motivated, their minds begin to warp 
They're not, they're, they haven't set their minds on Christ, and they've set their minds on ways to get ahead. And when it's not set on Christ, then in their minds, because there's this warping that takes place, then they begin to overlook and to undermine the standards of God to the extent that they, it, it just blows them out, right? And then the concrete sets, and they live with the consequences, right? They live with, with that poor. They've got their, 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 minds get, their minds get twisted up and, and, then, and then they can even convince themselves and others that it was okay for them to fudge a little. There, there are things that people concentrate on that warp their minds to their own ruin. I think about pornography, one of the biggest issues in our culture today, the, one of the most destructive in things that a person can engage in. But it is so abundant, so common, that there are people in our culture that are beginning to think it's normal. It's because, friends, their minds are warping. They do not realize that their view of God is being completely warped. Their view of themselves completely warped, their view of relationships, their view of marriage, their view of the opposite sex, their view of sex itself, all of it being twisted up and warped to their own ruin. Friends, sin maintains its power so long as we allow it to keep hidden. It is when it is exposed, confessed in a graceful environment and accountability is built in, and the Word of God invested, that we can be free from these things. But it's, de- it's destructive. Oh, it's devastating. Past hurts is another one. People concentrate on their own past hurts. And what ends up happening is because that's their focus, there's a warping that takes place. And it actually harms them. It's to their, it's to their own ruin. Now, the fact is, there isn't a person in this room that doesn't have past hurts. And the reality is, some of them are severe. They're terrible. I think about, I've been following a little bit of this Me Too campaign. Some of you are familiar with that. Hashtag Me Too. Women across the country, really across the globe are coming out saying, me too, I was abused, me too, I was harassed, me too, right? And it's the, the, to think, I mean, we're not naive, we know these things happen, but when you see it in mass like that, you're like, what in the world? It's brutal. But, if you're a me tooer, and then you allow that to be your concentration, it's going to hurt you more. Friends, God does heal the brokenhearted. God does bring justice. Whether in this life or in the next, God is going to, God is going to right that wrong. Right? He's going to come to your defense. And I don't have all the answers. None of us do, friends. But I know this. If we focus on our hurts rather than on Christ, we're the ones who suffer. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. And so we concentrate on Christ because there are things that people concentrate on in this world that distract them to their own harm. These wouldn't be things that are inherently wrong, like pornography or selfish ambition, but, but when they focus on them, they distract us. And there's plenty in life that can distract us. And we've got to, again, just kind of picture this. Focus, people. Focus, right? In the parable of the sower, some of you are familiar with that, is a story that Jesus told to, to reveal truths about the kingdom of God and about the way God operates. And, and he tells this, what we call the parable of the sower. And it's a 
fundamental parable. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't understand that parable, you're not going to understand any of them. So it's critical that we understand the parable of the sower. But he says that there are seed, it's the seed, and the seed represents the Word of God, and it's being spread across the field to different types of soil in a field, and it represents kind of the, the, the world, if you will, the different types of people in the world that the Word of God is being given to. And he said, some seed fell among thorns. That's what he said. That's what he calls it, which represents the Word of God being given to people who are too distracted by life to allow the Word to do its work. In Luke 18, 14, this is what Jesus said, and as for what fell among the thorns, he's now explaining what the parable of the sower means. As for, those, uh, as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. They hear the Word of God, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So yes, there are things that we can concentrate on that will ruin us, but then there are things that we could concentrate on that will simply distract us. And I want you to notice when you read, you got to, again, we pay attention to the language. They got distracted by concentrating on other things, the cares of life, the riches of life, the pleasures of life. And we can't help but notice in this passage that it isn't the word that is choked. It's the people who are distracted, who are choked, literally strangled by the things that they're concentrating on. When Peter tried to talk Jesus out of going to the cross, what did Jesus do? He rebuked him. Did he love Peter? Absolutely love Peter. Oh, man. Simon was his man, but he got a sharp rebuke from the Lord in that. He said, get behind me, Satan. Notice these words. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Friends, some of us who are deeply loved by God, whom God is entirely committed to, need to hear that same rebuke from Jesus. We have set our minds not on the things of God, but on the things of man. We care about the cares of this life and the riches and the pleasures, and we're not focusing on Christ. But he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things that are above, because there are things that we could concentrate on that actually will improve us to our own joy, to our own pleasure. Set your minds, he says. That's a verb. It's an action word. It's tied to what we care about. Again, it goes back to, you don't have to talk me in to coming to the table if it's got ribs on it. But you're not going to talk me into it if there's just a bowl of peas. The King James captures the heart of this instruction. It reads, set your affections on things above. Those who love God concentrate on Christ, not out of duty, not out of obligation. We focus on Christ in the midst of the business of life because we love Him. He's the center of our attention. When we're sitting in our classes, when we're doing our chores, when we're building our clientele, when we're closing the deal, when we're hanging out with friends, when we're surfing the web, He is the center of our attention. And when He's not, focus people focus, right? How do we do these things? How do we, we talked about setting those forms. How do we set our minds? How do we drive the stakes down far enough into the ground and nail them off so that when the, pow, when the, when the concrete is poured, when the things of life come in, we're set. We're not moving. How do we do that? What are some ways that we can do that? Well, it comes back to the very fundamentals, friends. It comes back to, to you and I saying, I need to set a time where I read the Bible and I pray on a regular basis. I need to set a time. This is my time. Don't distract me from this. Where we ask our family members to honor that time. Da don't bug me during this time. Don't interrupt me during this time. Unless somebody's bleeding out. I'm actually not kidding about that, right? I mean, we've got to get set. We've got to set our minds. When we, when we spend time praying and reading the Bible, studying, memorizing the Scriptures on a regular basis, doing what you're doing right this minute is super important. So I give you a big thumbs up. Good job. Absolutely. We're getting our minds set on the things of God. But this, as you know, is not enough. It's not enough. 
as, as good as this is. Right? It's not enough to really set your mind on the things that are above. When we practice biblical stewardship, when we honor God with the tithe, when we practice generosity and sacrificial giving, when we do that, we're setting our minds on Christ, on the things that are above. How so? Jesus said, your heart will be where your treasures are. So where are your treasures? Do you invest in the things of God? Do you sacrifice? Do you give God His portion? Because if you don't, your, your treasure's not there, friends. Your heart isn't either. Right? When we spend time with, with God's people, when we're, when we're committed, whether it's to a group or to a, you know, like a small group or, 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 or a, a team, of, a ministry team, when, we, when we're committed to those types of things, we're, that's part of setting our minds on things that are above. We're working for the things of God. I had an elder team meeting this last Thursday and got together with these guys, great guys, just the, love these guys, and we talked about, the, the, we try to share a meal together each time, and yes, there's business that we have to take care of, but we talked about the fact that being an elder in the church is, is not just about voting appropriately once a month, making decisions. Those are important things, but that's not all that it's about, right? Being together, having camaraderie, making Christ the center of those relationships. The fact is, sometimes people who are all Christians, Jesus isn't even talked about in their conversations. The weather is, and, the, and sports are, and their leisure time, and that's all good and fine. That's wonderful, but Christ has got to be at the center of it, friends. If we really want to set our minds on things that are above, we should be able to do that. We need one another. So we pursue Christ, and we concentrate on Christ, and then our final two verses tell us why. Look at these two verses. He says, for you have died. You do these things because you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, now that isn't to say that, that Jesus isn't with us right now. Those alive in Christ will one day be with Christ. But that isn't to say that he isn't with us right now. He most certainly is, but it's a relationship that is by faith right now. But there's going to be a day when it'll be a relationship face-to-face. Face-to-face, right? So, so we pursue Christ now. We concentrate on Christ now because one day we're going to be with Him. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with Him in glory. This passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning talks about our past. Look at this. For you have died, past tense. It talks about our present. So our past has been taken care of. Our our sin has been, the power of sin has been broken in our lives. Verse 3 expresses this past tense. You have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When we received Christ Jesus, the Lord, our past was set aside. Colossians chapter 2. Nailed to the cross, set aside, removed. We died with Christ. His substitutionary death was our death. Before coming to Christ, the scriptures tell us we were dead in sin, but now we are dead to sin because we are alive in Christ. Our past is taken care of. And living in that reality is what emboldens us in our faith. We're dead to sin. It does not have power over us. Though tempted by it, we can overcome. And it is in this hope of Christ appearing that we pursue Him, that we concentrate on Him, and thus we weaken sin and destroy its influence over our lives. Again, this isn't a once upon a time thing. We find Christ, Christ finds us, and we pursue Him continually. And after receiving Him, if we don't orient our minds with the Word of God on the ways of God and break those old patterns of thinking again by including the Word of God into our lives rather than seeking those things that are on the earth, if we don't pursue the things of Christ, we don't have to wonder why sin still seems so powerful to us. We have to set our minds. We have to seek those things that are above. Our past is taken care of. Our present is secure. And it is concealed from full display. I love, look, look at this again. You've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It has, it's a double meaning here. It's hidden. Hidden meaning it's kept safe. God is keeping us safe until the day of Christ's return. Now that, 
actually isn't referring to our physical safety. It could include that. Notice I said it could include that. But, and I know that so often, so often, our biggest thing is just be safe. We don't want anybody to get harmed. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that so long as we have big picture, const, big picture uh, construct here in, uh, in our minds about this. This isn't about being kept safe from physical harm. This is about being kept safe, our real lives being kept safe, our spiritual lives. We're kept in Christ, right? So is it wrong to say when we pray for somebody, God, keep them safe? Absolutely not. But let's remember, in, uh, like, we didn't just start this thing a couple of years ago. God birthed the church 2,000 years ago. And Christians all over the world for generations have been heading straight into harm's way for the sake of the gospel. Many of them have suffered. Many of them have been martyred for Christ and they're kept safe. God kept them safe. Right? Because we belong to Him, He keeps us. But there's also this idea, it's not just about being kept safe, but it's, we could use the word camouflaged. It's camouflaged. It's hidden. There's something concealed that will one day be revealed. Look at it says, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. A couple of verses here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But notice it, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. He's referring to our human bodies. Like we just look like normal people. Most of us. We just look like normal people, right? There's like, what's so special? Well, they're just like everybody else. Except for the Christian, the work that God is doing inside of us is forming us into the image of Christ. It's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's what's going on inside of us. Our bodies are the jars of clay and it's hiding the treasure of what God is doing in us. We just look like normal people, right? But what God is doing inside of us is spectacular, right? And he says, to show this, that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So what we are as Christians is usually not recognized. It's not very well known. It's undervalued in this world, but not forever. When Christ appears, we also will appear with Him in glory. Peter said it like this, 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen race, Anybody feel that way this morning? Just like, you feel like, I just feel like a chosen race. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's quite a description of who we are at this moment, but it just doesn't, I don't know, does it, do you feel like a holy nation? Do you feel like a royal priesthood right this very, you know, you're just like, I'm a human being, I'm, I'm a person. These attributes are very true at this very moment. But it just doesn't seem like it. it's that big of a deal. But what God is doing inside of us, friends, what God is doing inside of us is spectacular. Presently, it's hidden. But one day, it's going to be revealed. One more verse, 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. Everybody say now. We are God's children now. And listen to what the apostle says. And what we will be has not yet appeared. It's camouflaged. It's hidden with Christ in God. Let's go on. 1 John 3, 2. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. Ah, there it is. So our past is taken care of. Our present, our present is, is, is hidden. It's kept safe, but it's also concealed. But then our future, oh, here it is, friends. We don't know a whole lot about the future, actually, do we? There's a lot of surmising, a lot of guessing, most of it wrong. But one thing we do know, Jesus is coming back. You can go to the bank on it, friends. We don't know when, but Jesus is coming back. And He's coming back in full glory. His grandeur, His brilliance, His magnificence, His might, His splendor, and His power, friends, will be on full display. And this passage of Scripture that we're studying this morning says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with Him in glory. No wonder we pursue Christ right now. No wonder we concentrate on Christ right now because it's all that will actually matter. At some point, 
it's going to become super apparent that a lot of people have wasted their lives. They have spent their lives on things that matter nothing. There is no actual value to it whatsoever. But we who are alive in Christ pursue Christ and concentrate on Christ because in the end, friends, that's all that's going to matter. So we live for the one who is our life. When Christ, who is your life. He's our lives, friends. We live for the one who is our life. That's what we do. In the midst of all the other things that we do in life that we attend to, Christ is our pursuit. He is our concentration. Because one day that's all that's going to matter. Let me close with this. There's a, 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 I don't know, a cute little story. Jack Benny, you might, might be familiar with that name. He's a comedian from the last century. He's passed on now. But he's quite a character. And uh, a wealthy guy. And, um, and supposedly, rumor is that he was pretty frugal. A penny pincher, if you will. And uh, as the story goes, he was walking down the road one day and an armed robber came up to him and said, your money or your life? And Jack Benny didn't respond right away. There's this long, awkward pause to, to the extent that the robber finally said, well, and, and Jack Benny said, don't rush me, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story, but... Like, what is there to think about? Fill in the blank. Your blank or your life. What what is it that we're actually pursuing? What is it that we're actually concentrating on? To have found God and still be looking for Him is the soul's paradox of love. If you are found by God, if you are a Christ follower, you too can get distracted by the things of this earth. Paul is writing to Christians when he says, seek things that are above. When he says, set your minds on things that are above. What is worth living for? Focus, people. Focus. Let's bow in prayer. It's worth contemplating in the seriousness of this moment. How would you rate your pursuit of Christ? Is He your focus? Is He he the center? Or is there something else that seems to be more pressing that you need to be more attentive to? Oh, friends, seek the above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What would you say you're concentrating on? Are they warping you? Are they distracting you? Or are they improving you? Christ is your life. What is keeping you from living for Him? Nothing. Seek the above. Set your mind on the above. I'm going to close in prayer, but I'm going to ask the ushers if they'd get ready, we could receive the connection cards and the, and the offerings. Lord God, thank you for the truth of your word and in the, the sweetness of this moment as we are gathered in this auditorium having heard the word of God, we want to We want to think about some real important things here, God. Lord, where you need to uh, correct us, please do it. We trust you. You are good. You're loving. You're kind. You're just. Lord, where we need to repent, where you need to rebuke us, Lord, please do it. Give us your grace, good Lord. whatever adjustments we need to make, whatever we need to walk away from, whatever we need to deny ourselves of, whatever we need to repent of, Lord, 
Give us grace to be willing and glad to do it so that we can pursue you, so that we can concentrate on you. You are our life. We want to live for you. So that when you come back, Lord Jesus, the glory of that day will shine all the brighter. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. How we love you, Lord. Praise be to your name. Amen. You say amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's go ahead and pass those.